Okay, so welcome. So um, I'm Alexis Shotwell. I teach here in the Sociology and Anthropology Department, but um, I have been supporting people working on grants applications um, for a while now. Um, and I used to teach in a um, philosophy and interdisciplinary um, grad program. So I've seen a lot of uh, Shirk and OGS proposals from a lot of different disciplines and areas. Um, and so there's some things that are really similar across all of them. So the reason that Bernhard and I decided to do this workshop um, is that we normally do a workshop and most of the departments that you're in do a workshop in the sort of middle or third week of September that explains a lot of stuff about what the SHRC and OGS um, applications are, uh, the different parts of them. We often will have students come who have been successful in these competitions and talk about them. We talk about what the expectations are. And one of the things that we've found is that when people come to that workshop and they haven't started writing anything yet, it's really overwhelming and there's not time to do the kind of work on proposals that actually makes them really solid and good. Um, so we're trying to um, shift the culture a little bit so that we come to that workshop with some draft already written. Um, and so the, uh, the sort of adage that the best writing is rewriting is something that really is important for applying for grants. This is um, a proposal that is in some ways the least real thing you ever write, um, but the most crafted thing you ever write in this way. A grant proposal, a statement of purpose, a, a program of study, as Shirk puts it, is not a actual narrative of what you actually are going to do. What it is, is a demonstration that you can write a grant proposal. So it's different than when you do, if you're in the PhD, if you're in the MA or the PhD phase, you, you will write a program of study, a proposal for your thesis um, that then you workshop and work through with your committee. And the point of that is to ask, is this um, something that you actually feel moved to do? Is it important? Does it feel good? Is this committee the right group of people to support you in that work? Um, are you going to be able to finish it? Is it something that is doable in the time that you've laid out? Um, so all of those questions are questions about, is this a proposal for something that you actually can do? There's a certain way that applying for a SHRC or an OGS also asks that question. So if you put in a proposal that says that you're gonna change the state of the world and that you're gonna do it in two and a half years, the committee will look at that and say, this student is not competent to do this project because they can't even tell that it's a grandiose uh, proposal. So there's a little bit of reality, but not actually that much. The main thing that you're doing is showing that you can write a proposal. So we've had in our program students who are successful putting in proposals for projects that they're not actually interested in anymore, but they have a really polished proposal and they get funding and then they do another project and no one ever checks or cares. So it's not actually like, it's, and it's this very um, particular thing because if I put in a SHRC proposal for my own research, and then I do something radically different, SHRC actually does care about that. They're like, wait, you said you were gonna do this, but you did this totally other thing. We said we were funding this project. So at the graduate level, this does not really apply. It's just, can you put together a proposal that will get money? Um, now, uh, Andrew asked, what is the sort of weight of the different areas of the proposal? Like, what, how should we think about um, whether you've presented at conferences, whether you've co-published with your supervisor and those kinds of things. And um, you, there is some weight to these things, right? Like, are you an active student for your level of study who's done things? But what we're working on today is the part of this application that you can control. Um, so there's, so you can't actually control now, this month, the things that you've published or submitted or the conferences you've presented at. 
Um, and many people have not submitted to anything. They have not presented at any conferences. So just know that a lot of people, when we read these applications and when the higher level committees read these applications, there's nothing in those boxes. So don't feel like you should have something there. The two things that you can control now, between now and when these are due, are the program of study you write up, how clean, solid, beautifully articulated, you know, well-grounded that is, and how much you support the people who are giving you letters of recommendation to write good letters of recommendation. The main way that you support people to write good letters of recommendation for you are to give them a really clear account of what your project is, why you're really awesome, totally competent to do it, and how great you've been in relation to them. So we can talk a little bit more about what you give them to, to help them write a good letter, but it's basically that you wanna make sure they have the statement of purpose or the program of study that you're putting in. They've read it and understood it and can speak to it, that they remember their relationship with you and that they know the things to say about um, why you're so fundable and so great. Um, so irritatingly, the things that that includes are um, that you're brilliant, you're an excellent student, and your attitude right now with all of this is, I am brilliant, I am an excellent student, I definitely should get funding. So all of the parts of you that are like, maybe I'm not brilliant and fundable, and you just sort of be like, I hear you, and we're just not gonna think about that part right now. So you just be really entitled in um, believing and this is actually true, that you deserve money to do your work. Um, you all do. You definitely deserve money to do your work. Uh, they should support your work. It's, that's true. Um, so just kind of have that. Because the, the thing that sometimes happens is people start writing their proposal, and then they're like, I'm shit. I can't do this. They shouldn't fund me. I'm not even going to apply. Um, and it is true that mostly academia is about getting rejected over and over and over again. And it is true that you might not get funded. But even if you don't get funded, you still deserve it. So you should apply. So the, the main thing I want you to leave today with is just like, I am going to apply for money because I deserve money. Does that part make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. When you're engaging with your letters, letter writers, you'll give them your excellent statement of purpose. You have some relationship with them, and so you'll be writing them an email that says, that reminds them of what those things are, right? So, you know, dear professor so-and-so, as you'll remember, I took three classes with you in my undergrad. I got an A in one class and a plus in two of those classes um, on the, final paper that I wrote for the senior seminar that we did together, which was called this, you commented this. So if you give your advisor, your recommenders, all of these things, they just lift them and put them in their letter. Um, so they say, you know, Charlotte took three classes with me, got an A plus on her final paper. It was called this. I was so impressed with the way that she used this database that I commented, dirt, dirt, dirt. So this is part of managing up your your letter writers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's okay. Welcome. Is there any issue in terms of what point in your um, academic career as a recommender comes from? Because um, my MA is in English literature, mm -hmm. so it's a one-year MA, which means if I'm applying for a PhD to happen next year. I haven't made established any sort of real connection with the professors here. They haven't marked anything in mind. Right. So instead of paying me just undergraduate professors. Yeah. So the question is if you're starting your MA and you don't yet have relationships with any faculty members in the program that you're starting, is it okay to use to ask for letter writers from your undergrad? And the answer is yes, you should. So you should prioritize people who can speak with some degree of specificity and um, you know, scope to you. And so that's going to be the people who know your work best. Um, in the OGS 
case, you also need to include a little spiel that says, what a great leader you are. So this is really um, frustrating. It's a super racist, ableist, and sexist question that OGS asks recommenders to speak to your leadership qualities. And usually your faculty, for good reason, have no idea about your leadership qualities. So it's good to send us your resume, but it's better to say, um, for the OGS recommendation, you'll be asked to speak to my, and you can look at what the OGS asks them to do. Um, I wanted to highlight for you in case you didn't know that I have been involved with, you know, this youth group and I have, yeah, and I've demonstrated leadership at the university through being connected to the Graduate Students Association or in my department, I helped run the conference or things like that so that your faculty can say, um, they, they do amazing leadership in the, you know, because often what ends up happening is the faculty just say, I have no idea about their leadership. This is a stupid question, which it is. Um, so you can, you can prime your letter writers for all of those things. Yes. I have a related question to one before. Um, it's about choosing which reference letters because it's going to look suspicious on if I don't use my MA supervisor. I'm only using my current PhD supervisor. And then there's another um, professor I've worked with my undergrad, a law professor, who have done much more Work. and writing a much yeah. better reference. Yeah, so it's good to, so the question is, should you prioritize the person who technically supervised you or the person who you're currently working with and people who can speak more fully to your work? In general, you should be using the people who can speak most fully to your work. Now, especially at your career moment, it's not weird to have your current supervisor rather than your MA supervisor. Um, and it's not weird to have a, a person who can speak to the arc of what you've done. Um, if your undergrad thesis supervisor, you're an MA student right now, and you had a bad relationship with your undergrad supervisor, you know, um, there, it, it more is an issue when you're applying to a program if your supervisor isn't writing you a letter of recommendation than if, um, the, in the, than if your supervisor for the grants isn't writing you a letter. So the main thing is that when you're asking people, you're asking, can you write me a strong letter of recommendation? And if they hesitate or they say um, no, <laughs> then you find someone else. And that's, but you do want to be asking people. So I frequently get asked for letters from students who just, who took a second year class with me and they liked me and, and I was nice. And so they ask me if I can write a letter because it's scary to write letters. And I always write back and say, it's not a good idea. You were in a class of 100. All I can speak to is what I remember of you. And you know, it's better for you to ask people who can speak to the kind of work that you're, being, you're going to do at the, um, you know, at the graduate level. Yeah. Uh, does, can, it, can you use uh, professors from other universities that you've worked with? Or does it have to be a professor you've had a class with? You can use work. You can ask for letters from professors at other universities that you've worked with. You just want them to really be able to speak to the project that you're proposing to do. Um, and it would look weird for you to have no faculty from the place where you're doing the grad degree. Um, but again, you're starting the MA, you know, so you have the experience of studying overseas, and so you can, you know. But in your case, also know that letter writers from the UK tend to be there's like jokes about this, that letter writers from North America are like, this student, in 20 years of teaching, I have never met anyone better. <laughs> and the equivalent letter from the UK will be, she was a very fine student, right? So letters from North America tend to be gushier, and letters from the UK tend to be really um, low key, in a way that sometimes gets read as they didn't think she was a good student. Mm -hmm. Cool. Bernhard. Um, I just wanted to say, I think should the regulation says that one of the references has to be the current supervisor, so that also constitutes a problem of good change in universities. Oh. Um, because they can remove their supervisors. Um, so, Bernhard is saying that 
Shirk maybe has a, a guideline that you have to be have one of the recommenders be a current supervisor at the institution you're enrolled at. And I don't know about that and we should look into it because we definitely tell people when they're first starting, when they're applying in their first year that, that they can have both of their, so we should look into that. Yeah. Or ideally, right, yeah, yeah. Okay, the language is should be, yeah. Oh, should be your master supervisor or a doctoral supervisor. So that makes sense. So your master supervisor could be from your last program um, or your current doctoral supervisor. So two is my belief. Um, there's two for sure. Two for sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, um, as I said in my introduction, been out of university for 25 plus years. Mm -hmm. I am going into the PhD program in the School of Social Work. Mm -hmm. So this is all new to me. I Many of my professors are either dead or retired. <laughs> so, so ghost writing the let no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I did, I mean, I guess fortunately I was in a leadership role at the University of Manitoba and reconnected with a number of my old professors when I was there a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But they are retired, but I'm presuming that they're able to provide me with the letter of recommendation. Yes. Two references, I could do that. But do they have to be academics? So ideally you would have people who are academics. Okay. At least one really needs to be an academic who can speak to your academic work. Oh, you're, oh okay. Yeah. So, and <laughs> so, I mean, I'm in a bit of a disadvantage simply because I've been out. Because of being out, out, yeah. out for so long. So it's totally reasonable to start talking really directly to the director of your program. Yeah. The person who's the temporary or first year supervisor mm -hmm. and to really find out how they are going to support you in doing this. And so that might mean that they really are able to talk about how excited they were to admit you to the program, why they felt like your work was so interesting and important. Mm -hmm. So it's not the case that it's always people from before who write letters. It, yeah. Like I have written letters for people who are just starting in the program and written strong letters for them. So that's possible. Um, and it's, you, you will anyway be yeah. having them work, be having whoever mm -hmm. writes for you look at the current program of work that you're proposing to do. Right. So, so you'll be sort of guiding them anyhow in how yeah. to talk about that. But really important to have at least one person who as an academic can speak to the academic quality of the project. Well, uh, that, that won't be a problem. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. No, that, yeah. That won't be a problem. Yeah. I'm just wondering, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll work something out. Yeah. <laughs> but do you, like, it's normal to talk to the grad coordinator in your department um, to ask the specifics of how they do these things. Because does everyone know how this, how this works? Like what happens to the, so, so you write, you write up your application, you finish it, mm -hmm. you get in touch with your letter writers as soon as you can but definitely no later than two weeks before you need their letter from them. And I recommend writing to them a month before the letters are due and saying, I just wanna be sure that you can write me a strong letter. So you wanna really like set this up so that they're gonna write a good strong letter for you. Then the grant applications come, so this is new in the last six years. They come to two layers of committees on campus. So there's a committee for the department that you're applying through, whichever your department is. The graduate committee reads the applications and ranks them and writes, for sure, we write blurbs about why we think your application is so great, about 250 words. So, um, so that all happens kind of in-house. OGS goes up to an OGS committee for the whole university it used to be that this happened provincially, it left the campus. Now, my understanding is that OGS is decided at Carleton. So they don't necessarily take the departmental ranking as 
uh, the final word. They, it, they use it as part of their consideration. And what they actually do is kind of opaque to us at the departmental level. Um, but then they make a decision and that's determined partially by how many OGS awards your department got last year. SHRC is different. It also goes through a departmental project, gets these blurbs, blurbs <laughs> which OGS doesn't get. Uh, and then it goes to a university level re-ranking system. And then it leaves and it goes to a, a national level ranking. Part of that mm -hmm. is determined also by how many SHRCs we won last year. So there's this complicated algorithm that tries to distribute shirks equitably among schools that get a lot of them and schools that don't get very many of them. And so there's all these different points where things are just out of control, out of our control, and we don't know what to do, you know, to get the most number possible. So it's again this thing of like only controlling what you can control, um, which is you have already become the person you are who's in grad school and who's applying for money. And so the things that you can manage are the letters and the writing and the statement. The main thing you can manage actually, aside from those two things, is turning it in on time. Like if you do that, you're really doing great. Uh, they're due different times. So I believe that Shirk it's, and it's different for SHRC MA, SHRC PhD, and OGS. OGS, I think, is due this year, December 1st. SHRC is due um, November 20. Anyway. SHRC PhD is first. Yeah. Middle of October for the SHRC PhD. Yeah. I made sure and OGS PhD in yeah December first. Thanks. Yeah. So the reason to be doing what we're doing today, which is we're actually going to draft this, is that usually what happens is you start school. It's super stressful. You're starting your TA ship. You're doing all these things, and then it's like September 30th, and you think, "Whoa, I better start working on my." thing and your faculty members are too busy to give you feedback and and then you put in something that you don't feel good about yeah so it's great if you can get to september 1st with a statement of purpose that you feel pretty good about um, that you want to can start circulating and editing I don't know. It's like maybe should twenty hours? And then she said twenty hours. And I don't have twenty didn't, hours. She didn't believe it, but but she she said in the end she came back and said that it was like it was more than that because she was so okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's good to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really is a long process. And if you start in the middle of the fall, it's very hard to do something that you feel really good about. Okay, so any other questions about the general context um, and what you have control over? Yeah. Um, how much can you use kind of the same statement of purpose for both? Um, good question. Right? How much can you use the same statement of purpose for both SHRC and OGS? So significantly, um, but SHRC is longer. No. Really? Okay. It's good that you're here. <laughs> yeah. So SHRC, the PhD statement of purpose is two pages, and the OGS statement is one page. Um, single spaced, super short. Um, but yeah, I think you're right that the MA, it's all just one page. And so it's not long. Like it's, you can really tell that it's something that you're not gonna be able to say very much in. Um, so you just can say enough. Um, it's really important not to have that one page be 
a super tiny font where you've changed the margins so that there's less space between each letter to be able to put more words in. So a good part of this is relating to the fact that when I'm describing all those different committees, they're all reading a ton of these very fast. And so one of the things that you're doing is making a thing that they can read very easily, um, including that it has enough space for them to read it, including that it doesn't feel too rushed. So part of the performance that you're putting on is, look at what an incredibly competent person I am. I don't even need to use that many words to make my incredibly neat project sound good. Um, so it's, there's all these managing the artifact pieces of, of doing these. Bernhard, did you want to say something? No. no. Yeah. Um, but for folks that are working on the PhD version, um, there's also a quality of you, you have a little bit of a, you finish the, the SHRC app early. This doesn't apply to the MA students, but you finish the SHRC app and then you have another month or two to edit it down, cut, to cut it in half. Um, and so that's a, a nice editing project. Um, and also my belief is that for the Shirk uh, PhD application, you have up to five pages of bibliography, which is not counted in the um, statement of purpose two pager. Um, that bibliography, is that like, um, uh, I can't see you writing a two page proposal and referencing that many authors, right? So this is like a sort of suggested literary literature review type of? Yeah, the bibliography that's, that you can include, and I recommend that you do include, is um, sort of like, it's more in the category of relevant work. So it's not everything that you've cited. It's not just the things that you've cited in the statement. It's the context of what you would be engaging with. And so sometimes people also will break that bibliography up into sections. So um, we'll talk a lot about the way that you uh, capture the different literatures that you're engaging, but you can have subheadings within the bibliography, alphabetical within the subheadings mm -hmm. that are like, you know, um, what's an area that someone is thinking about. Academic writing. So you can have like um, a subheading that is like bibliography, uh, studies of um, the relationship between um, writing across the curriculum and writing within the discipline. Um, studies about, right, like, so you can break up what the different topics are. Um, supporting academic writing at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level. And you can guide that intellectually so that your readers look at it and say, oh, look, she's, she's accurately mapping that there's a whole bunch of work about the debate between writing across the curriculum and writing within the disciplines, and that there's a difference between supporting graduate writing and supporting undergraduate writing. And, you know, yeah. So you're, you're still using that bibliography as part of your argument for yourself as a good, um, fundable person. As far as I remember, they don't specify the citation style. Most people put um, the citations in parenthetical, um, parenthetically, and so that there's a, um, you know, like here I'm, I'm ticking off the people, I'm citing the people that you expect me to cite. Um, but this is also something that might be, there might be some specificity that is in the, yeah, I don't remember it. Um, so you should do it, do what's normal for your discipline as a general guideline. Without, unless there's something where it's like, you probably in the statement of purpose will never have a list of 14 last names and dates of publication um, because that would be weird. That would probably be a thing where you should break that down um, or uh, make a footnote where you say the literature on this is extensive, see and then list 14 people. Okay. So no more general, because what's gonna happen next is we'll take a short break and, um, and then we're gonna 
go into actually starting some writing. Yay. Everyone's like, I just want to write. That's all I want to do. I'm really, okay. Um, so let's take a, um, let's take a five minute break so we can stretch and move around and, um, and we'll come back, um, Andrew and Taryn at 315, if that is okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I'm going to end the meeting. So okay. log back in at 315. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep.